Mr. Derek Vienhoff. He's better known as Deke. Drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. Yeah, Deke. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with Lalo Dagash. Once again, welcome. Thank you for having me. We're episode 86 now, and we're with Lalo, the Chilean Palestinian. Do you still call yourself that? Is that your moniker? Or are you just, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I usually, I, I understand when people say that they don't like to highlight uh, their ethnicity. I've met a lot, I, there's a lot of people online with very interesting ethnicities who don't highlight it. Yeah. Um, they say they don't want it to be distracting from what they're saying. And I, I, I understand that. I even agree with that to some point. Um, but I tried to highlight it mine actually as much as possible, not to give me credibility, but just to point out that Chilean Palestinians exist. And it's not just some small thing. I, I, I forget if we've talked about this in the past podcast. Yeah, a little bit, did. but can you give us uh, and our listeners a refresher course of where that comes right. from and what Chile has to do with Palestinian? And- I think yeah. I, I went into a little bit more depth last time we spoke. I saw. I was yeah. rewatching a little bit of what we talked about. So, you know, you, you, somebody can go back and watch that if they if they want to know more. But basically that it's the largest Palestinian uh, population outside of the Middle East. Like, uh, what is it? Twice or three times more than the U.S. Um, but yeah, and then a lot of people don't associate Palestinians with Chile. Mm-hmm. And uh, and even if you look outside of, of Chile into Latin America, Latin America has the largest Arab population outside of the Middle East, much more than you'll find in Europe or Australia or even the US. And people largely ignore the Arab uh, uh, population that's in Latin America because overwhelmingly they're a Christian. And so there's not a lot of the same controversies you'll find when it comes to Muslim Arabs, uh, which is the main focus, I guess, for the West because of, uh, especially after 9-11, um, which I, is understandable, which is understandable. That it's a concern, you know, with, with, a with, a Muslim populations and extremism, hopefully not to the point where it gets into the point of bigotry. Um, but unfortunately, because of that concentration on, on that focus on Muslim, on Muslims, Muslim Arabs in the West, they start to assume that this is the representation of Arabs right. in the West. And it's very unfortunate that people just gloss over the fact that there are many kinds of Arabs. They're, they're not that much of a minority, Arab, uh, Arab Christians. And I would say even probably most of uh, the Arab population in Latin America is greatly secular, despite uh, being of Christian backgrounds. I mean, at least in, in Chile and a lot of the, the people of Arab background that I've met from other parts of Latin America are very marginally religious, you know, even if they're from a Christian background. Um, and also, they're very, they're usually very successful in Chile. The Arab uh, population and the Palestinian population has not only integrated, but it's you know they, they, a lot of politicians in that, a lot of successful businessmen historically. Um, and I mean, speaking from my background, I mean my my uh, my 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 father, my grandfather, my brother, all physicists. Uh, so and and pretty firmly atheists, pretty firmly atheists. Uh, right. So, so yeah. there was no um, Muslim background in your family. Then, is that the case, or how did you get attached no. to the ex-Muslim group uh, through the Twitter sphere and all that? Uh, initially? Uh, so, first, um, yes, that uh, very historically, Christian Palestinians is what what I come from. Uh, Orthodox Christians, uh, especially from a place called Bet Jala, um, in 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 Palestine. And um, that place is known, if you even look it up on Wikipedia, is historically a Christian Palestinian town. Hmm. Um, so it goes back, w- way back to uh, to the Christians of, of that area. Um, but it's, uh, what was the other thing? Well, so through, then I guess through the oh, atheism why, why, in that, is that why, where it why came Why I got get associated to... The to, Twitter uh, sphere of, yeah. The Twitter really sphere. Well, you know, the, the, I actually didn't have anything much to do with ex-Muslims when I first started uh, tweeting. I was just very interested in the conversation about Islam. Um, is it, you know, partly it, it's, it is the, uh, the rationality in me to, and the anti, uh, anti-theism in me and an admirer of people like uh, Christopher Hitchens and when, when he was still alive and following his work and many other people who were 
popular at the time, like yeah. Sam Harris or Dawkins. And um, seeing that, you know, criticizing Islam was as legitimate as criticizing anything else. And I got involved and also for the to the point of view where also I wanted to portray the point of view of, of somebody from a Palestinian background who comes from an atheist Christian, very, you know, very outside of the 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 prejudice, you know, the stereotype of, yeah. of what a Palestinian or an Arab would, would be. And and also being Chilean, right, that 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 we exist also in Latin America, that we're from this background and that uh, that, you know, I'm an atheist. And also my my family is a is very, you know, very rational thinking. Um, you know, you, my grandfather is now passed away. But I, when I was little, I would see these conversations of religion and, and science between my father and my uncles and very anti-religious people, <laughs> right, okay. you know, not anti, not anti-religious, you know, that it's but not a word that they would use, yeah. but they would, but they would be very critical, very critical. Like, you know, this doesn't make sense here and then yeah. there. And also, you know, and, and really when they get into their arguments, it's all about, you know, physicists and physics right. and, and such. No, it's interesting. I had this, it's basically the opposite. Whereas both sides of my mom and my dad's family are like Dutch Christian reformed, uh, background. Mm. So, um, some, some of them a little more than others, as far as how much they adhere to doctrines and that. But, uh, I, I was from that millennial generation that had, uh, was interested in phys physics and these things and had heroes like, uh, you know, Bill Nye or Bill Gates or any of the bills that are <laughs> somewhat <laughs> scientific, yeah. um, you know, but, um, so how would you describe, sort of when you came on the scene, so to speak, being on Dave Rubin's show and hanging with Gad Sad and those types of guys. That's a long time ago. Long man. time ago, but how would you I just want to, make, want to make clear this was a long yes. time ago. Yes. No, no, we're, we're, I'm sure we're going to get into that, but I'm trying to f sort of picture this in my mind. How, how have you seen the landscape uh, of that intellectualism sphere change in the last four or five years? Or how oh, have you changed yeah, it all? That, so I know it's a large conversation essentially, uh, but yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, that's a large conversation. And I mean, I don't want to speak ill of, of individuals. I know a lot of people like to, um, maybe we'll get into some specific individuals in the future, but again, even if I'm, I'm criticizing them, I, you know, people can get pretty nasty online. Yeah. I, I feel that too. And I don't mm -hmm. want to pinpoint to, I, I see exactly what you're saying. Um, but I but, think but it's, it's useful also, I would to say, mention them. Yeah, I, I would say that like it, it's it is shocking to me the amount of people who have leaned towards uh, supporting Trump and the right and values that I thought were just not of their of their belief um, when when I you know compared to years ago when I was associating with them. Um, it's an odd thing because you know I'm I'm actually not right leaning or, or left leaning. And I don't identify as a centrist either. And you asked me how I've evolved. I would say that I have become more of a misanthrope, more hateful towards uh, not people, but groups yeah. um, and, and uh, political leanings and right. everything like that. Again, not a centrist. I don't fall in the center, fall against like everything. Cause I see way too many, um, mistakes and too many of my my opinions would fall all over the place and sometimes not even not it would be non-existent mm. you know if you were to ask me about economics or or w what my, my opinions are on social issues uh, you know what would I what would I what group would I fall in I would have to call it like Lalaism yeah. right um, I mean take, I could give you an example as far as um, uh, my opinion for example if people talk about socialism, are you a socialist or are you a, you're a capitalist, you know, and, and I rarely see anybody express my point of view on, on these topics. So I don't know any group that I would fall in because my point of view is the degree to, of socialism versus capitalism. A country should be is dependent on that country, right? Right. If they have a lot of natural resources, maybe they can lean more towards socialism, and invest more in education, free education, free healthcare, et cetera. Um, but if you're in a country, for example, like Korea, South Korea, that I've lived in, doesn't have almost any natural resources, right? Their natural, their only resource is the people and their intelligence and innovation, et cetera. They can't lean very hard towards socialism. They have to lean very hard towards innovation and capitalism. 
and that can cause its own problems, but it's, they don't have a lot of other options. They don't have oil or, or, uh, or, or any kind of other natural mineral to, to sell. Um, so, I mean, how many people say that? How many, everyone's like, you know, no capitalism is, is you know, is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's one or the other. Yeah. It's, good, it's one or the other. <laughs> and it's, and I would say, well, no, it's conditional on, on your situation. And even a country tomorrow, I mean, what, what's going to happen with Saudi Arabia when, uh, when oil doesn't, uh, doesn't have the price it has because a car, a cars go electric. And I've ta- and I've spoken with people in Saudi Arabia who tell me Saudi's already thinking about this because they know it's coming. Right. Right. So they're going to have to, uh, you know, maybe change a lot of their economics and everything. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it, to me, um, I would say is going back to what you, you were asking about uh, the political sphere. I, I see people kind of morphing from left to right a lot. And I see people leaning now very hard right. Um, supporting... but they don't call it hard right though. They they always it's it's this phenomenon. I don't know what the name of, of it is, but like when someone says mm-hmm. I'm not anti-vax, but or I'm not right. anti, but like I'm not right wing, but and they have these caveats to everything where they put themselves in this magical category that cannot be penetrated by anything. And they're and I again I don't mean to harp on like Ruben or whatever, but they just stand out as examples because, for example, when you initially were on that show and and multiple times you you guys were highlighting a lot of important things but then uh it seems that certain topics have just been reiterated reiterated constantly by by Mm -hmm. guys like ruben for example like whether it's the free speech issues or the big tech censorship where not that it's not an important issue but it seems like there's only two or three pet issues that they every Mm -hmm. episode is always about that thing and then uh, whereas I see guys like Sam Harris, for example, where he's been a little more steadfast in his views. I mean, he does change his views depending on evidence, it seems, but he has a wider range of topics that he touches as well, where it seems like more of an intellectual pursuit where some of the figures out there seem like they're not, I want to say grifting, but they have a definitely a, a, a range of topics that they stick to. Ah, okay. I see. I see where you're going with this. And yeah, I thought about this as well. And I, I see this as a fault of myself being online and trying to play this game of, of being an influencer or whatever you want to call it. So a political commentator, yeah. et cetera. I don't think I'm, 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 um, I'm designed for it right? because I see what's necessary for it is to be a Jack of all trades, hmm. even when you're not. Um, so you might have knowledge of one topic and that, topic and your comments on it might get you a lot of attention but then the the attention fades but you've decided that twitter and youtube and having a show or something is your livelihood so there's your topic was israel palestine or something but now the topic is um war with north korea yeah, you don't know anything about yeah. North Korea, but it's the hot topic of the week. It's in yeah. the cycle. You got to talk about it and you have to act like you know about it. And <laughs> people do this every week with every topic, no matter whether they know about it or not. I see people who generally talk about politics and maybe social justice warriors and freedom of speech suddenly are virologists, right? They suddenly they're they're experts on on vaccination and they're experts on on diseases and and you know how to prevent diseases on social distancing and lockdowns and things like this and what happens is that these people suddenly you know have to feed their audience with opinions even exactly. when they're not knowledgeable about it i'm not capable of that i'm not gonna i understand talk that. out that of the proverbial sense. ass yeah. right yeah well this um, is interesting because this is the virus has shone the light on that because like what you just said, like if there was no coronavirus, then they may be, they it would be some other topics that they'd still be doing that. It could be anything. Uh, but, but this yeah. has really, and it, I think this has made me very, um, I don't know how to explain it. I went more left wing, if that makes sense, I guess, because I was so just pissed off at all this right leaning or hard right people who were just so anti science in the, in this past year. And, um, it, it, that's a great point that you said that the, the, they're all of a sudden virologists. Um, whereas like that is a complex, uh, like if it was something geopolitical, they could at least have an opinion. And can it, I add, it, yeah. it's, it's not, it's, it's half their fault. 
The other half is the audience who right. do what I call prophetic information seeking. Prophetic okay. information seeking, where people will, for every single topic that comes into the news cycle, there's a person they go to for their opinion, even if they're not experts on it. I'm guilty of that. I mean, I'm definitely guilty of that. I, I see what you're saying. And I, I yeah. even with, I, yeah. I, I look to a degree, I'm guilty of it too. I've done it at times too. But I think at least to some degree, more than the average person, I try to find experts on whatever topic I'm reading about. If right. I want to know about virology, I download a book, there's audio books, there's, there's, uh, there's Ted talks, or there's, you know, you know, I, I find who is a, who is a person to read about from this? Who's a person to follow on this topic? And I, most people, I don't think do that at all. I think most people just go to their go-to profit, right? Yes, you, because you, know, you like because everybody likes their show. Like, well, for me, for for a lot of people my age, it was Joe Rogan's podcast. But now he's got a lot of people dissing him sketchy, and not quite little sketchy very sketchy people, people on sketchy, his show. And people, people are yeah. letting him know. Like, people are not shy to say this podcast is shit now. Like, it's just mostly terrible. There's a few good guests here and there, um, but but that I can totally see that. Point yeah, I where, don't I don't always agree with jo, uh, Joe Rogan's philosophy towards towards things it's it, i understand like oh i'm open to talking with everybody but it, he's coming in and sometimes a little bit too ignorant on a topic where you leave yourself open to a lot of misinformation if you're sitting down with somebody who's not necessarily an expert on on to on the topics you're 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 even going to right. investigate and that's your only source of information. Well, he's talking you know, about masks they're... and the virus with the guy who's wrote a, who wrote a book about masks don't work, like you know stuff like that. Uh, well, I like, didn't see that. Oh, but it's this guy. I, I, you know, I started. Name. I stopped watching. Him. Yeah, me too. But it's mm -hmm. something, Alex something or other, and he's this gentleman who wrote a book that's all about anti lockdown, anti mask, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, of course, mm -hmm. you're highlighting this one person's point of view for you know two or three hours. Whatever. It's very. It's very. I mean, the the what you're getting to very much lar larger than just the specific people you're talking about. It happens to everybody, right and left. is It's it's a very complicated situation right now as to how to get good information and the the inclination of people to to uh, distinguish good and bad information. I, I'm very uh, you know, in, especially in the last few years, and maybe especially during the 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 pandemic, I've noticed people are very very bad at filtering out bad information uh, i mean i could talk for example to an example i mean you're talking about people who are online and have twitter and large twitter accounts or youtube ch channels but for example in chile there's a huge problem problem I've, I've i've noticed that i kind of saw before but it exploded during the pandemic and that's false information spreading through whatsapp I don't know if you use WhatsApp and people don't know. It's it's just a messaging yeah, a service, yep. mm -hmm. right? From, you know, it's just a messaging service uh, on, on your phone. It's very big in Chile. Everyone uses WhatsApp. And I notice everybody sends videos or some kind of copy and paste forwarded message with uh, information that is totally bunk, right? It, it's just, it's in pseudoscience. It's nonsense. I got a video of a girl saying that... Uh, Alcohol can can uh, cure COVID in the early days of the pandemic. Um, I, I I mean I can't even remember, but my my family will get these messages and, and they and, just share it then, right? And, yeah, and people will forward it. But and this happened I, to me too with just Facebook chat, right? The like the day of when they started, mm -hmm. well, you know, late March, whatever, when things started shutting down around the world, or at least North America. The same thing. I got messages and friends of mine got messages about, you know, there'd be an audio recording of some doctor that's saying you got to gargle with salt water, whatever, similar things right. to that. And th those right. things just spread like wildfire. But go on. Right. And I, I, I would say those things may be spread more than the people you're referring to who have YouTube channels. Right. The, the big, right. Those people right. Don't, don't necessarily, you know, spread internationally. But a lot of these small videos will will spread out. I mean, there's gurus on youtube whose numbers you wouldn't believe yeah. right they, they their numbers are gigantic well into the millions and you know i and i also get articles from uh from people sometimes who are who 
or Trump supporters who live in other countries, friends of mine, and they will send me things that clearly are from a link and a website that's not trustworthy. It's some blog. And I'm like, you know, this, this isn't valid information. You know, you have to double check and they just believe it. Yeah. And, and so it's not, oh, it's not entirely the fault of the people spreading false information. It's also that people are not educated right. or just don't care about filtering out bad information. But this is getting worse. I thought it was going to get better because around, again, when we talk about this 2015, 2016 time period, I felt like there was this evolution happening. And although you had Trump and all this going on, you still had people kind of waking up to information, I felt like, but now it's just getting more convoluted and people are... There was a common. moment there where I think where I remember thinking that independent news was going to be revolutionary. I think it was when the uh, uh, the plane landed in the Hudson River. Oh yeah, remember the the, the yep. you know the pilot who yep. had to land in New York in the river, and remember that people were putting up videos and photos before the news was right, and that was one of the first times that happened. And that was, and they talked about in the news. Oh, oh, you know, people beat the news to the news just right. with their phones. And everybody was really excited. Like, oh, this is going to, you know, make news, you know, for the people and, and more trustworthy because, you know, you filter out the middleman and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and what happened in, in reality is just it got bombarded with a bunch of charlatans. Yeah. Right. And th the problem is there's charlatans all over the world who know how to scheme and trick people and suddenly they have access to the entire world and i i you know everyone's complaining right now about cancel culture and censorship i'm not entirely sure that absolute freedom of speech and and zero censorship is the answer to these issues oh i, I it's it's, no, it, it's a I agree tough there. one. Yeah, I hear what you're saying there. I, I, I'm not saying like I'm totally for censorship and, you know, and it won't be abused by governments if you go down that line. But I see, you know, there's a big problem and that it, and you can't just toss it away by saying, I believe in free speech and end of story. And so there's no problem here. There's a gigantic problem of misinformation. Yeah, it seems, well, it reminds me of what you're saying about capitalism and socialism. It's, it's not that there has to be ultimate free speech, everything goes. Like, I, when it comes to, for example, Trump getting banned from Twitter, I know a lot of people mm. were for that, myself included, but I was surprised by myself that I was for, I was so for it, if that makes sense, like as a political stance, like, because I used to think that that, hey, that's kind of bad if you just censor the president, he's the president, but, but this, the amount of shit that the guy was saying for four years, like was just, it, 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 it pushed that, uh, limit I, I was, I was very surprised about the how many people don't don't know what the First Amendment says. But then I, that's what I first thought. But then I saw people defending Trump's right to be on Twitter by actually posting the First Amendment. And then I just I I'm, I have to wonder: Is this person illiterate? Because it very clearly says that the government shall pass no law, et cetera, et cetera. Right. First right. Amendment says nothing about one person having to platform another right the first right. amendment purely says the government can't censor someone that's it right Twitter but the argument the they say but this is this is a new world yada 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 but that's what the say for example the left sure. would say about you gun can, control they can, say this is a new we need to modify this to to our modern okay then modify it then you, then your argument <laughs> is to modify right, it. your argument right. not is not that it, he's it's he's, not that he's being censored then is right. that you need to modify the first amendment exactly but that's not what right. people are saying i never right. see people saying that <laughs> Right. I see people saying his First Amendment right is being infringed. Here's the First Amendment. It doesn't say that, though. <laughs> so yeah, what is yeah. your point? Right. If it's the, to uh, amend it, you know, to, to change it. OK, but I, I see people and then I, I see arguments like, well, Twitter is so huge and it's such a you know gigantic platform. You know, people need access to it. But it's not it's, it's well, not even it's like, that it's big, but people don't. The percentages of people who use Twitter, like, say, in America, it was it. Isn't it like 10 or 15 or 20 percent or something? <laughs> And also, if you go to like the the list of most users on a on a social media app, I think like Twitter's twentieth or something right, like that. Right, right, right. It's really low, yeah, <laughs> and it's yeah. not that many people. It's 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 uh it's not as big as people think. Now, it is used primarily by politicians and people using text, right? Like there there's 
a lot less politicians will get the word out through Instagram than through Twitter. They won't use Twitter right, much more. That's right. that's true. I'll give them that. But again, it, the fact that it's it's big is not an argument. There's nothing yeah. about big. Yeah. Right. <laughs> in in the First Amendment that doesn't say anything about that. You know, it's yeah. a private company. They don't want them a, a person on their platform. That's the end of it. Every other excuse I've heard are, would be things to you would need to change the First Amendment. Oh, it's it's so big. OK, then you need to change it. Oh, well, it, you know, it's it's a new world, et cetera. Then you need to change it. But right. people aren't saying that they're saying, no, it, it's it's infringed because Twitter. Yes. No. <laughs> and I mean, th this also speaks to a bit of the like Facebook taking down misinformation video, like those pandemic videos and stuff like that. People were also it's a little bit different situation, but pe I am so glad that they started that fact checking stuff. It's, it's their company. And started they tagging down, things with COVID and all that. Whatever they want. It's amazing. Like, we need that because like we were saying earlier with these people who just share things uh, without thinking um, some of those they're so deceiving because they're so well produced some of these videos and you know, the people have the little letters beside their name, they have PhDs and, and whatnot. And I, I understand the counter argument to like what we're saying. I understand that if you open up the door to censoring misinformation, you open up the door to people uh, censoring certain politics that they don't agree with, you know, canceling people because they just don't like them, et cetera, et cetera. I get the counter argument. I understand it. I understand like it can be abused by companies. It can be uh, abused by by people. It can be abused by by governments. It doesn't negate the fact there is a gigantic problem that is ignored by these free free speech absolutists. Um, that misinformation causes gigantic ja damage to people, and especially during the pandemic, misinformation didn't just make people ignorant. It can lead to people dying, and that that was yeah. a very big turning point for me where I saw people spreading misinformation that didn't just make people ignorant, you know, it could lead directly, not indirectly, directly to their death. When I saw Candace Owens, the person you mentioned before, in the early days of the pandemic in the United States saying, you know, the, the common flu is more dangerous than COVID, which yeah. she posted multiple times. Yeah. And she posted numbers about only this amount of people have died from COVID in the United States versus last year, this amount died in the flu when COVID had only existed for weeks in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense. It's, it's not even been, it's still not even been a, year, a full year. It still hasn't even been That's exactly <laughs> it's, right. It yeah. still hasn't even been a whole year and the numbers are, gi are gigantic. And then people will, will turn around and say, well, they're inflating the numbers, but then you talk about China and they're like, no, they're, they're making the numbers smaller. Yeah. So which it's, is it? It's like you've talked yeah. about China. The numbers are huge. They're 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 downplaying it. Oh well, you know what about the United? Then they're downplaying the United. States. No. Yeah. They're, then they're inflating it. it. It's it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, and we've talked about this. I talked about this uh, with Dr. Kevin Folta on my show, where we talked about the the death certificates and how people the comorbidity uh, thing that people don't understand. They talk about dying of or with COVID. Um, they'll they'll try to say that you know. Do you remember that thing that came out from the CDC that said about what it was eleven percent? People mis uh, misinterpreted it that eleven uh, percent of the numbers were actually from COVID. The others were just people who had COVID but died from something else. But the it, I forget how to and explain it. It, it, it was it was revealed in New York that uh, Mayor Cuomo had actually been downplaying the numbers. Oh of yeah. COVID. Oh yes. Okay. Then and, and I that's what I suspected. Because I had heard it from that, that exactly that was happening in Chile, um, that the numbers were not inflated. They were being downplayed. And right. sometimes they're downplayed sometimes for political reasons to show they're doing better. And sometimes it's, it's the case because um, there's no other choice. Because if somebody dies from COVID and you don't know if they died exactly from COVID, yeah they don't have the time in hospitals always to do these tests exactly there are Which, these yeah. you know hospitals in chile just like in the united states just like everywhere in the world are flooded and doctors are overwhelmed and they're working 24 hour days and if somebody dies they don't have the time to analyze and spend hours maybe trying to figure yeah. out why this person died and sometimes they'll say well i think it was COVID," but oftentimes they say you know i don't know or it wasn't and sometimes yeah. it might have been covid related but also if they if you have covid and then you ha you have some other comorbidity 
it's still COVID that killed you. It's just that the comorbidity I, yes. allowed yes. COVID to basically kill you. So, um, yeah. and yes, you're right. The, the scientifically speaking, the numbers are undercounted as well. Yeah. And you, any, any scientist, epidemiologist will tell you that. Uh, I, 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 a hundred percent will never accept these people who say, well, no, he died because of X, not because of COVID. You know, the, he, uh, even though he got COVID while he had that sickness. No, it's and COVID sickness, that, and yeah. COVID inflated, you know, his, his sickness or, or, you know, he, he, they, he brought down his immune system and that's what killed him. I will never accept that because my father was just few days out of coming out of chemotherapy uh, when the pandemic started and uh, he's fine. He hasn't got it, but if he got it because his immune system is way low yeah. and he's very old and he died from it, somebody would say, well, he had cancer. It wasn't COVID then he wouldn't count. Fuck off. No, no I don't it's COVID. Yeah, it's I don't, COVID. I don't accept that. Yeah. I don't accept that. Um, but devil's advocate a little bit to what we're saying about the censorship, censorship and all that. Uh, I was mm -hmm. like, listening to Ruben today. He had uh, Dr. Drew and that um, M dog, dog MD guy, really intelligent doctor that. guy who's more of a progressive anyways. But Z dog yeah. MD or something his name is. He's got a huge yeah. following. He's actually good at like debunking stuff and whatnot. But he had this little panel yeah. and I, I just checked, tuned in. So and, he is uh, an MD? This person yeah, he is an MD? Yeah. And uh, then he had this lawyer on from Quebec or something, and they were talking okay. about uh, how Dr. Drew and these different guys stuff has been demonetized um, because they are just discussing the eff the efficacy of lockdowns and stuff like that. And I think sure. I can see a point where um, physicians talking amongst each other about the different implications of lockdowns. And, you know, like you said about countries being different as well, like sometimes mm -hmm. for a country a lockdown may work, but for another country, it might not work. Like there, I think there is merit to a discussion about lockdowns. I think if, even if you talk to scientists, but it, it is kind of strange to me that YouTube and these larger organizations will sort of shut. Maybe it's not on purpose. Maybe it's like a, they cast a wide net to demonetize mm -hmm. certain things, but um, just to play the devil's advocate, I think it is interesting that certain topics are not sort of, allowed um but i just i, I do think that uh these right-wing leaning people let's say do harp on that a little too much i don't know how I dangerous think, that really i think is. right i think right wing i i think it's very unfortunate that things like lockdown and mass have been, become so politicized and polarized that if you're right leaning you have to be anti-lockdown and anti-mask maybe especially anti-lockdown more, more than anti-mask and, you know, it's very dangerous what they're doing sometimes. I, I, I showing the danger of the internet and the amount of mis misinformation that spreads the kind of guru pseudo intellectual videos I've seen spreading with friends and family members is so troubling and it's not just like you know flat earth theory where you just look silly um it's it's like putting your life in danger and lives of others in danger and when it comes to things like lockdown you know i see people like cause spreading ideas like that lockdowns kill more people than than uh than not having lockdown Right. So, um, so you know, locking people down, more people would 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 die than than allow people to to mingle amongst each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but the, and, the, and, yeah. and a lot of times, I see people give excuses. For example, for for example, that you know, suicides increase or domestic Ooh. abuse increase. You know, they would these numbers would never come. I want to see the numbers. Yeah, I always. Who, yeah, I want to see. But those the, I mean, yeah. when you say when you say the numbers, I mean also every time. Every single time I see this argument had amongst people online in, in some chat, they compare the numbers of people getting sick on a graph during the lockdown. Apparently, I mean, this is mind boggling to me that everyone yes. thinks this. It's yes, they don't see the, the counterfactual. They don't they don't understand the, the concept. The the res, the the effect, the uh, efficacy of the lockdown won't be seen 
until weeks, maybe a month later. Yes. And the numbers, and you might even see a, a, a sharp increase during the lockdown because those are people who got infected yeah. and, and were in an incubation period before the lockdown. Well, we just had that here in Ontario and Canada. We just had that by Christmas time. They had a major lockdown, the whole province, emergency shutdown, mm -hmm. and the numbers increased. And so everyone said, see, the lockdowns don't work. And then a few weeks later, like now the numbers are just tanking. I mean, they're saying there's going to be a third wave because of the variants and whatnot in April. But yeah, it's a it's a delayed. It's thing. I mean, it's also a big problem that suddenly everybody had to become a, an expert on disease control. Right. In, in within a, in a few months. And that's never going to happen. And with the Internet, everyone's spreading and trying to make sense of all of it. I also understand how, you know, people are going to see numbers and, and it's not like I understand everything, but yeah. I can understand that much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's, it, even when I point that out, some people just don't want to hear it. Yeah. I mean, and I'll, kudos to Dr. Drew because he did apologize at one point because initially he did say it wasn't going to be as bad as they're saying. And then he apologized and walked it back. Uh, he got COVID and I think he's getting over it now. But on this episode as well, he, he of course had to mention, you know, that it comes from the law concept of lockdowns comes from a 14 year old high school student in the United States. And then their father took that and adapted it to this and that and blah, blah, blah. And Bush administration adopted it. Uh, this. And so Ruben said, oh, no, great. A 14 year old is making like it's like oh. are you guys really like yeah. uh, like what does uh, that even matter like what if that? this 14 year old is su super smart anyways you know what does it matter that they're 14 reg regardless but but obviously people who epidemiologists and, and that are uh you they're not just looking for hey did this 14 year old post a idea let's take this idea and put a you know a lockdown in place like these are concepts that the experts are dealing with there may be pros and cons Mm. of these measures in different countries but just to say it's like such a logical fallacy to say that you know this 14 year old kid came up with it therefore you know it's bad mm. like very strange but maybe we can transition all this stuff kind of relates to our conversation about Majid Nawaz and what you've mm. been harping on lately with um, Majid and maybe we can give people a little bit of a background a refresher on who he is what he went through how he uh, founded Quilliam and all that and then and then what he's sort of up to now or what you've perceived uh with him lately okay well let's start with what he's up to lately. okay <laughs> work backwards so lately people are now criticizing him greatly people who were fans of his because he has he is suddenly and i think i i, I don't follow him very closely but i believe it was around the exact time of the elections the election in the United States, where he suddenly started repeating every talking point of from Trump. Uh, he started saying the elections were a fraud. Um, sometimes he's, I should be careful because he, he's he's pretty he's pretty he's he's pretty tricky about how he posts things. He won't right. outright say yeah he'll say here's the election a post, was this is just, I here's no a opinion. post yeah right so so he will he will share a post about this person saying this, but he's also sharing very monothematic points about these things. Like he will share right. a post of somebody saying that the election was stolen, and he will never sh share a post from somebody saying no the election fraud theory is a myth, and here's why he's not yeah. going to share that. Right. So. You know, I, I don't really, even if somebody doesn't say something directly, you can get their their intentions by a certain pattern, what they share or won't share. Yeah. Um, you know, it, at least if he would share both sides, you know, you could say something there. Maybe. I don't even think that that's really the, that's that fair. But um, so he was sharing things about the, the election being a fraud. He was sharing things about... Um, that and and it was Antifa that stormed the Capitol. Yep. He he, was, he has said that uh, China spread out uh, spread the coronavirus to uh, to impose lockdowns on the West and destroy them economically. All kinds of crazy uh, conspiracy theories. And now people are saying, "Oh, he must have lost his mind." And uh, I don't think he did. I don't think he's I don't think he's an idiot. I think he knows exactly what he's doing. I don't think he became a Trump supporter overnight. Mm -hmm. I think he now needs uh, 
a new talking point because I think the Islam reform thing is, is kaput. <laughs> I think I think nobody has any interest in, in in Islam anymore. I think he has a he has an organization that requires millions of dollars of income that they got used to, and now they need to talk about something else. And I think talking about uh, Trump and being tr- pro Trump is uh, very lucrative. And I think a lot of people have have discovered it's very lucrative. And I think that's why a lot of people are leaning that way. Um, so a lot of people who are very, very critical of me, of being critical of Majid Nawaz, were suddenly saying, ah, oh, OK, you were critical of him before. So I don't want to I don't want I actually don't want to talk too much about what he's talking about now because anybody can see it. Hmm. I want to talk about why I started being critical of him actually years ago. OK even though I was at some point a supporter of, of some of the ideas. But I started to see that the whole reform thing for at the beginning was um, illogical and possibly even dishonest. Hmm. And then later on, I came to the conclusion, not only is it illogical and impractical, but it's also hasn't occurred at all. He hasn't reformed anyone. Mm. Okay. So to start at the beginning, Majid Nawaz claims to be an ex radical fundamentalist. It's very vague about what he was. He's also very vague about what he believed. I've never, uh, besides reading both of Majid Nawaz's book, radical and Islam in the future of tolerance and watching countless interviews with him and talks with him, He'll never outright say what he exactly believed as a fundamentalist. He's not going to, he doesn't say, hmm. I believed all Jews and gays should die. Right. I believed all women were lesser human beings. He just, he's very vague. He's like, yeah. I was a radical. I was a fundamentalist. I was an Islamist. You know, what, what does that mean? And what did you believe below this? You know, hmm. who knows? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make it clear. Um, but the idea of reform, you have you have to come at it with some sort of credibility if you're going to do that and majid nawaz is of pakistani background in the uk and something that he didn't mention in any of his books is that he's of sufi background and to write your own autobiography and it concentrated on you being a religious fundamentalist and not mentioning that you're from a very tiny religious minority is a big deal it's like somebody writing about being a Christian and their Christian upbringing. And then after the book came out and years later, he says in an interview somewhere that I was Mormon. You'd be like, you'd be thrown back. You'd be what you were. What Hmm. is a, is a Mormon, a Christian kind of sort of not really. Yeah. Right. You know, yes, it has its origin there, but no, if you're a Mormon, you have to say Mormon. You, yeah, <laughs> it's it is dishonest to a degree to say you're Christian, especially if you're trying to start a whole movement behind behind it. And he said in an interview with uh, I think it was Sargon of Akkad, and a bunch of ex-Muslims messaged me and like, oh, he said he was he was a Sufi, he was brought up Sufi, and he even said in the interview that uh, Sufism is the original form of Islam. I so hearing things like this about him, I understand most people in the West don't understand what this means. If I said he's a Pakistani Sufi who's proposing to reform the Sunni Arab world, right? Most people are like, okay, because they don't know what these things mean. They don't understand the conflicts. They don't understand that Pakistani has no real. Um, um, kind of credibility with Arabs to try and reform an entire the, the sure. essence of their yeah. religion, which is the most important thing in their lives. They don't understand the uh, you know the, the the linguistic and the cultural differences there. Uh, they don't understand what it, what what is the difference between a Sufi and, and a and a Sunni or and a Salafi especially. What is the difference between a Sunni and a Salafi? Most people have no idea what I'm talking about. Even the people who follow closely, Majid Nawaz and Sam Harris and Ayan Hirsi and all these people who talk about Islam 24-7 don't have much of an idea what it specifically these things mean, right? And these things are very significant. 
Hmm. And Majin Nawaz has never, ever brought up the fact that it's he faces many hurdles to try and reform Islam, like being of Pakistani background, like being of Sufi background. Like, okay. And the only way I, I can explain it is with the analogy of imagine uh, a Japanese Mormon in Japan hmm. proposing to reform the Catholic Church. Right. And let's say he contacted Richard Dawkins and Richard Dawkins like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with my religious friend here. He's, he's, he's proposed reforming the Catholic church and right. we're going to write a book together and we're going to reform the, the Catholic church, et cetera, et cetera. And he's a Japanese Mormon. <laughs> right. And okay. How in that analogy, how would you, and do you think people in the West react? You'd think D Richard Dawkins lost his damn mind. Right. Okay. Right. You'd same be like, that's not like. going to happen, Richard. <laughs> right. But Sam Harris did it with a Pakistani Sufi who's claiming he's going to re reform the Sunni Arab world. And everyone's like, bravo, here's my money. Hmm. And he got millions of dollars to propose this. Years later, I have a simple question and I've, and I've posted it on Twitter and I've asked this to Sam Harris directly. Name me one person that he's reformed to his version of Islam. Name me one. Just one. I'd like to speak with that person. I'd like yeah. to interview them. I'd like to hear about how they adopted it. There's not one. Has Sam ever touched on this at all? I haven't heard any peep from him about Majid for a while. I, I, I asked him about this and, and uh, he named Adam Dean. Okay. You know not who familiar. Adam Dean is? No. Yeah, it's, it's very unfortunate people have no clue about the names of any other person in Quilliam other than, other than Majid Nawaz. Yeah. Adam Dean was for years, not right now, but he was for many years the executive director of Quilliam UK. Okay. And you want to talk about Quilliam and Majid, and you have never heard of Adam Dean. Yeah, yeah exactly. I am trying to shame you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to shame you because people only know about magic and they have no idea who else is in in that organization yeah and they're a they're a bunch of pakistani bangladeshi sufis and they're not that liberal and they're not that secular mm. and they're not as liberal and secular as Majid Nawaz presents himself mm. or the organization these so for example when Sam, like Sam told me, you know, he mentioned Adam Dean. I was like, well, for one, you're telling me like the one person that is reformed is a person who works for them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, a person right. in charge of doing right, this, this right. project. And on top of that, this person is not that reformed. You could go to Quilliam's own website on YouTube and they have a, a debate between Bill Warner, who is a writer of Islam, who I'm not that familiar with personally. But he writes about Islam and he debates Adam Dean and Adam Dean sounds like a total fundamentalist mm -hmm. in that in, in that uh, debate, saying things like you have no right to even be talking about Islam as a non-Muslim. Uh, he he, he <laughs> starts to dig at him like, or, or, like, what religion are you? As if he was going to say Christian. He's like, no, I have no religion. He's like, oh, about you Christian? He's like, no, I have no religion. He hmm. doesn't say atheist, but you know, you could assume he's an atheist. As if, you know, if he was to say something, something like Christian, Christian or something like that, he has no right to, to be speaking about this. And he he go, it's a terrible, terrible debate. And it's not a person who sounds very liberal to me. Hmm. Um so Quilliam is is not made up of secular liberals, yet they are getting financed by atheists. Right. You know, and why are atheists sending money to an organization that is to a Muslim organization that is not very secular, that is proposing to do something that over years of getting millions of dollars has shows no evidence for. And on top of that, it's not really even a moral thing that they're proposing from the point of view of atheists, not imagine was I'm talking about atheists who are pushing for this. I don't think it's a it's a good idea for 
atheists to be saying, look, this is what I think is true. I don't think religion is true. I don't think there's any evidence for it. This is what I, this, this is what I think the reality is. But the truth is too much for you, right? You're religious and you're bugging me. You're doing all this terrorism and you're doing all this misogynistic stuff. It's bugging us. So we're, we're giving you something. We're giving you your own religion, but a lighter version of it. We're giving you Islam light. Right. I don't believe it, but you should for my sake. Yeah. Do people not grasp how from the point of view from a Muslim, this looks and, and right. the, the kind of arrogance of it. So it's like, might it's, as well just keep promoting atheism rather than you should propose, you should reforming. propose what's, what you think is true. Right. Because if you, I mean, you're the atheists are starting from the point that we don't believe this. No atheist is promoting reformed Islam because they think it's true. Yeah. They're saying, no, I don't think this is true, but go ahead. But you and, should believe it. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you should adopt this lighter version of this religion. Right. Just for my benefit. Yeah. It is strange. when you th Yeah. When you right. overview it like that and you think about it like that versus when yeah, you think it, about it like that. But let me tell you something. That's how Muslims probably see it because put yourself, put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. I you're wouldn't welcome it. Country, I wouldn't, you're, yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be welcoming yeah. it. No, that makes you sense. You wouldn't be welcoming it. Yeah. That makes total sense. But uh, I think you might have said this before, too. But like the way Sam says things is just always so convincing. And he's, you know. He's part of the he, he was convinced by a lot of silly ideas from from Majid. When I heard him in a a public talk, somebody asked him, like, Sam, you know, you're such a big proponent of atheism. Why are you suddenly proposing reform? <laughs> and he said he was convinced by Majid Nawaz that he's not going to make the entire Muslim world atheist overnight, mm. which is true and sounds very convincing. The flip side to that is that it's kind of implying that you could make not overnight but let's say in a speedier time people reformed to another form of islam right and i, I think he, yeah. he says also like you know because of the the current situation uh, you know violence you know we need something to to change the minds and change the the culture expediently right. i guess the idea is like this it's is, like you think it's being more respectful because we're not, and more practical yeah it's the, like you, you keep your religion whatever you believe that's fine but please don't be so misogynistic violent yada 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 it right. kind of it makes sense a certain way we look at it but when you when you explain it like that that it wouldn't it doesn't mean it would be more welcoming and it's also less likely because to actually change a religion you actually need to be very convincing and have a lot of authority this is a very important thing in people's lives Right. Not just anybody can throw this out. Not just anyone can reform the Catholic Church, obviously. Not just anybody can reform, you know, the the Church of Latter-day Saints. You have to have some authority. Imagine what doesn't have that. The, not only does he not have that level of authority, again, no one was convinced. Unfortunately for Sam, convincing people of turning them atheists than this reform nonsense mm -hmm. and but but the 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 other and very important thing is that i think Majin knew all this Majin knows very well because he's been to the middle east he was supposedly in jail in in egypt he's been around sunnis he's been around arab communities he knows he has no weight to do what he was proposing a Japanese Mormon would know if he's lived in Italy, he has no way to change and reform the, the, the Catholic church or, or Catholics. He knew this, he knew. And he knows that he hasn't reformed anyone. He didn't reform his local mosque in London, mm -hmm. but kept getting millions of dollars to, to keep doing it. Hmm. Um, I think this is a, ki a, a, a kind of pyramid scheme with a person at the top convincing others to sell a product that's never sold. Right. right. You know, our pyramid scheme work where you, you have a product like juice, like in the, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. If you've ever yep. seen it, 
Oh yeah. They, they, they portray a, a pyramid scheme where yeah. somebody gets, you know, juice that they're from a guy that they're supposed to sell. And then they, they, instead of selling it to people to drink, they give it to another person they recruit to sell it and then, and so on and so forth. And the product never is sold. That's a pyramid scheme, right? This is, it, it's not exactly that, you know, people are not being hired to do it, but essentially people are sending money up the chain and promoting this product that's never really consumed. Right. No one consumed ever uh, reform, but people kept funneling money up the chain. Yeah. Do you for think what? so? Just subjectively, it's just a cool job for him to just kind of go around and talk and do his radio show and just kind of get paid to just kind of float around. I, like... I look, I, I, hmm. I can't. I, I mean, can only speculate. I, you can speculate as to what somebody's <laughs> thinking, but I, but I can't, but I can ask questions. I can say, where are the people who've been reformed? Right. Adam Dean. You know, you know, I, I can, I can say that I can, I can talk about like, show, you know, show me the money, show yeah. me the, the, the reformed people. Show me, show me the, the, the talks you've, you've made in mosques. Show me that you've traveled around the middle East, giving talks to Muslims, you know, re reforming them. Show me you've gone around London to mosques yeah. and, and and they're like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Cool. or debating mm. with you, at least, you know, some kind of argument like, well, who are you to say, that? oh, well, it was gay. But no, it's just no, I, yeah. I see them giving talks in in atheist uh, meetings. Yeah, they're like, this and, is a good idea. You should keep reforming. Yeah, and they're all prodding themselves on the back. Yeah, yeah, we, we should reform Islam. Great. Yeah. What? <laughs> You're, you know? Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. I like the way you break that down. That's important that we have people like you sort of in the know that can see these things and sort of I, exposed I, another uh detail to that is one of the reasons i was convinced of uh that a lot of the reform proposals were nonsense was were from ex-muslims who were telling me imagine knows he can't do this and it's impractical and illogical to even attempt to do this there, there's no point in even trying hmm. and i can tell you that a lot of these ex-muslims didn't say these things publicly in fact they even praised Majid Nawaz and reform hmm. while at the same time I was hearing about how this is all nonsense and I recently tweeted about this and Jay Shapiro who directed Islam in the Future of Tolerance the documentary yeah. below my tweet saying you know ex-Muslims were telling me that this is all nonsense and Majid Nawaz is you know proposing things that are logical but they would out you know in public praise him he wrote can confirm <laughs> oh my goodness so, did that documentary actually lot. come out or did that i thought it was produced and never was released or was it i think it was released but i never saw it because i was waiting I for it, it and then yeah I, I didn't see it actually come out or was promoted so i kind of forgot about it i but... can i can ask him i can ask him to send me a link but i i actually have never seen it okay yeah <laughs> because um... by the by the time um it was released i was already out the door with uh with reform and, and magic. So I wasn't going to spend my money on yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's interesting. It's uh, a lot to unpack, but uh, Majid, I don't know, man. I don't know about you anymore. Um, maybe we could do a little bit of a speed round before we close. I know there's a few other things. Okay. We talked about uh, the, uh, her name is Gina Carano, the, the actress from Mandalorian that this whole, she's been fired, but now did we get to the bottom of what was her sin? She just mentioned that Jews were persecuted in the Holocaust, or was there something more that we've? There's you know? I, look that the, the thing about Gina Carano. I think there's a lot of things behind the scenes that uh, maybe yeah. we don't know about. That, maybe that's that, my, but that makes sense. I, I suspect that because it doesn't really seem like the things that we're being presented as reasons for firing. Yes, seem like real reasons. And so one, people are saying it's like this comparison to the to the persecution of Republicans and Jews that she was fired for. I don't buy that. That's a, that's a reason. I don't, I don't even think that a lot of the progressive types in, in, a, in a social justice wars, et cetera, care much about anti-Semitism these days. I think it was mainly about maybe the pronouns controversy. And another thing I, I, I have to assume is that Lucas films or Disney or whatever warned her, like stop tweeting. Yeah, that had to have happened at some point, right? right at some point, right. somebody told her, like, you know what, stop. And you know, you represent Disney, which is yeah. wholesome and family friendly, and you're doing these very controversial political tweets. And I don't really have a problem with companies telling their employees, like, 
your image represents us. I think that's true. Yeah. And I think they have the right to ask somebody like, don't say crazy outlandish things when you represent our company, you're the face of our company. I, I don't think that's wrong. And so somebody had to have told her like, you know, tone Relax. it down. Yeah. And she didn't. So was she looking to get fired? Maybe. Well, uh, yeah. And then that? now she's teaming she up just... with Ben Shapiro to do some sort of show. Yeah, that's, that that seems like an odd was, coincidence. That, 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 that she lost me there. She lost, yeah, <laughs> she lost there's... me when she, <laughs> Yeah, but that's she what when you said there's something behind the scenes that that that, that just those things go together. It seems she she must have some sort of strange views that maybe were creeping out I, of yeah, the yeah yeah I I yeah the whole Gina Carano thing there's there seems I my suspicion is there's a lot of things behind the scenes that make me hesitant to kind of come to any kind of conclusion about where I stand on it. Yeah. Um, last time we spoke, we talked about North and South Korea because that was when they had uh, Trump went there and, you know, they went across mm -hmm. the border and that, to, and this was supposed to be, you know, great Trump doing his peace, peace thing, you know, Trump's the peace candidate and all that thing. Um, mm -hmm. What has happened? What has transpired since then? I mean, I don't think any there, I, I read a little bit here and there tidbits, but They've still done missile tests back and forth and different so things. Really I, I saw a little bit of our talk and I saw just the piece actually where I where we spoke about North Korea. Yeah. And from what I was watching, I guess we were talking about this while the peace talks were happening. I think so. Yeah. Because I said something like, um, well, if anything good comes of this, great. But I don't think it will. Yeah. So I so I guess we were in the, we were in the middle of it. And I said, I don't think anything will come of it. And I was dead on yeah. as usual. Uh, <laughs> I was exactly right. And uh, since then, um, so, the, so Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un signed a paper that promised nothing. And it was said that we are promising to have more talks later on. Yeah. And all the Trump supporters said, Trump has solved the, the North Korea problem. Yeah. Immediately later. I think it was less than a month later, they did another missile test, nuclear test. And not only that, but North Korea went back to threatening uh, the United States and speaking hmm. ill of it and saying it's the devil, et cetera. Oh. Same talk as, as prior to, to Trump's talks. And this, whilst Trump was still president, it was only you know a few months after that as well that this happened. So what was accomplished? More nuclear tests, more demonization of the United States in their own country, no uh, denuclearization of their program, uh, no improvement on, on human rights. So what did Trump accomplish? He accomplished giving countless compliments to one of the worst dictators in the world and the worst dictatorships historically. That's all he accomplished. He said he said all kind of great things that yeah. uh, that Kim, Kim Jong Un, you know, oh, he's you know he's a tough leader, you know he's he's a uh, he's got a big responsibility, or I, I don't know what. But he he made multiple nice things that he said about about uh, about Kim Jong Un and North Korea, and I'm supposed to believe that he was playing 4D chess and and getting and and he's he's accomplishing something using some ty type of brilliant diplomacy. The hilarious thing about this is if Biden did the same thing with any other country similar to North Korea, as far as like socialism with China yeah. or, or Venezuela, he went to these countries, he signed meaningless papers. He, he gave endless praise to, uh, to uh, let's say, Nicolas Maduro, right? Oh, he's a great guy, you know, very responsible about his country. I'm going to sign yeah, papers. Exactly. With papers. How many of, of Trump supporters would def would defend what he's doing, or just say, "Oh, he's he's selling out to he's you know validating these horrible dictators"? It may, I I have no idea what the standards are for Trump supporters as far as like socialism because Trump is very pro hardcore socialist countries. He's anti China, but uh, but pro North Korea as far as his, the way he's treating them. And yeah. one will say, well, one is he's being tough on China. Oh, but the other one, that's just smart diplomacy. And and when and then when Hillary Clinton was very antagonistic towards Russia, oh, so you want war with Russia. So then do, do Trump supporters want war with China? Is is uh, is is it would Biden 
praising yeah. China be smart diplomacy. What is the standard here? Is, it, is, yes. it, is it is it being, you know, these peaceful talks and praising the other side or is it being tough like Trump is with China? Right. There's no there's no consistency to these arguments or positions as far as I can say. Whatever Trump does, they find the logic in their brain to validate it. Yes. There's there's no actual thought behind analyzing what's being done. And the only difference I can tell for, for Trump as a person as when he chooses to demonize a country versus praise its leader has nothing to do with it, the country being a socialist country or capitalist country or being a, a democracy or a dictatorship. Who's ever nice to him and praises him, he's nice to them back. Yeah. Remember, he was also very antagonistic towards Kim Jong Un at the beginning. Remember, he was threatening to bomb them with nukes. Little Rocket Man, Little Rocket Man, and all that, and then flipped. Yeah, when, very you know, strange. Yeah, no, that's you know, Trump for you. Yeah, and so anyone who's if you if you praise him, he like doesn't matter what you are. He doesn't care. <laughs> he just wants to be praised. That's yeah. that seems to be the only standard he holds. Yeah, a bit of an egomaniac, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you uh, recently watched a couple docs. You watched uh, Heaven's Gate doc, and then uh, you said one about uh, abuse within U.S. gymnastics. Um, I've what, any insights that you um, gained uh, any of these topics? Because the Heaven's Gate has been done many times, like as far as podcasts and docs and stuff. But did you? Um, how was this one? Did you like it? I I liked it. I, I think there's a lot of other, like you were saying, there's a lot of other things done about it that it didn't go too far more into it i do think it's that most of the heaven's gate stuff doesn't have the nice format that this show had uh, most of the documentaries are very old yeah. and not very outdated yeah and the other stuff is mostly podcasts and people speaking about it um what was the title there, sorry well, uh, the heaven's gate one heaven's gate the cult of cults cult of and that's cults. a phrase that the leader says at some point in the, in the documentary uh, and actually now that you're bringing that up actually i haven't done my podcast for maybe a couple years. And one of the reasons is I'm decided, I didn't know what to do because I didn't really want to do much more about Islam. I didn't, I don't think I have much more to say about it. Um, and I was deciding what to do about, uh, to do my podcast on. And I've decided to go down the road of investigating mainly cults. Cool. And uh, that so was going to be my next question was what are your next projects and that. So yeah. So, and know. even right today I was rewatching the show, um, the vow about the Nexium cult. And I'm going to do a podcast about reviewing that documentary this, this week. Okay. I'll have to check um, that one out. And just cults in general and, and cults aren't necessarily even of a religious standing. Yeah. Well, Nexium actually wasn't a religious cult. It was a self-help cult. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a cult around diets or exercise or, or, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to necessarily be around a religion and many cults aren't. Um, well, I, even Trump itself, I would say there's a cult around him. They, it shows, it shows most of the characteristics of a cult, I'd say. Hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, going back to, to those documentaries, I would say the heaven's gate one is, is yeah, there's, there's a lot of heaven's gate stuff out there but i would say this is the best one maybe you could watch um i read a book about heaven's gate prior to this and um you know if you like a couple years ago um it, and it's it's a very interesting cult because it, it wasn't necessarily what people thought it was it it wasn't a science fiction um alien worshippers cult it was actually at its root a christian cult Hmm. that tacked on some new age ideas, but at its base, it was Christian. Huh. Um, obviously indistinguishable from like regular Christianity by the end, but you know, that, that was in there. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, athlete a about the sexual abuses in, uh, in us gymnastics. I just think that's another great example of, my male ignorance about the reality of being a woman mm. and that might sound very male male feminist and 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 uh so no, but that's a great point yeah no that's but, but I, I it can't be denied i mean these things just keep coming out and yeah they're and, and the, the a, a very important point about this is when i hear these scandals coming to light 
I see a lot of conservative voices saying, for example, I remember Ben Shapiro talking about the women who started speaking about, about uh, Harvey Weinstein. And he said, well, you people are also responsible because you should have spoken up earlier. That's a very ignorant statement because if you look into it, they had. Right. All these people had spoken up earlier. Bill Cosby, there were, there were cases against Bill Cosby. The woman yeah. had spoke up years ago. But they, still, right, don't, you know, don't, uh, they still don't believe them then. They, they never believe them. So when are they supposed I to saw, speak up? And I saw an interview with, uh, with uh, Harvey Weinstein's ex-assistant. And he had sexually assaulted a woman in his room who went to the assistant. And they tried to get a case against him. And the lawyer said, it's just your word against his. Settle out of court. You're never going to win. Plus, he has too much money and too much power. Mm -hmm. So they settle. The, these little girls in U.S. gymnastics, they spoke out. They told adults. Yeah. And, and, and they hit it. They told their parents. They, people knew. When, I mean, the, the crazy thing about um, Athlete A and the U.S. gymnastics school, uh, scandal is that it's the structure of abuse and covering the abuse up and moving the coaches around once the like once they're accused of something they move them to somewhere else it sounds exactly like the catholic church hmm. and their sexual abuse scandal hmm. exactly person at the top they get the they 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 said they got the accusations from the victims they said we're going to investigate it they don't hand it over to the police you know right. when they internal the investigation police. yeah yeah they, you know and so what what made me wonder about watching the U.S. gymnastics things, like, oh, this structure is exactly like what happened in the Catholic Church, and this has nothing to do with religion. Hmm. This is a sports team. So, what other things have this structure? Hollywood, gymnastics, the Catholic Church. Maybe we're just scratching the surface of 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 this kind of a, uh, structure of abuse towards girls, and. We have we we're, we haven't even seen all of it yet. Maybe there's a lot more out there. And again, as as a guy, although there was a lot of sexual abuses, obviously towards men in the Catholic Church, but I think there's a big difference between bringing being brought up a guy in this world and a woman, and being always having to be on your guard against sexual advances. Oh yeah, I mean, I think it might be the understatement of of you know of all time because uh, yeah, uh yeah. yeah and even again speaking to like right-leaning people who sort of uh make these brush it off yeah well, like uh steven crowder said something about aoc that when she said she was abused or whatever who i don't know the details but she had mentioned that she was abused and steven crowder posted which i think was supposed to be funny but i don't get it, it was a meme of like mm -hmm. Karl marx and it said hey we found a picture of her abuser and it was Karl marx Look, and, I don't, I, I don't I like get, it. I, I don't like AOC either. I don't yeah, like her. But I don't get why that's I, funny. But, but, but that, that's not funny. No, that's and that's, not funny. it's not only that's not funny, funny. It's disgusting. Yeah. And that's why they don't like. They always yeah. ask why don't they come out earlier. Well, that's why because you poke fun at it and you. Well, well, one they do. They do come out early. And yeah. But but then when they do come out, they're told either this is going to be swept under the rug, or you don't have a chance of winning it. Right. And you just right. have to put up with it. Or, or, or and all, and also just the idea. I mean, also you you put yourself in the uh, in the shoes of these women. Let's say you're an actress and you know you've been sexually assaulted by a director or Harvey Weinstein. Do you want to put yourself out there in your name that you know you'd hope to be a famous actress one day? Now you're just known as the woman who accused, accused the guy yeah, of something. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you want that to be the only thing that comes up when people Google you. Right. I mean that that's a that's a that's a lifelong decision to to make there. Right. And it's not an easy thing to decide. I don't think I would do it. I don't think I would want that to be associated to my name. For, yeah. And like, he's, like us as men, we don't often have to think of those hypothetical situations. Like we are so ignorant to that side of things. Because Very of course, ignorant. And, and I, I don't know about you, but since, you know, watching all this stuff, like watching the heart of the, the Epstein documentary and documentaries about, Weinstein and athlete a and all yeah. this other stuff. One of the things I did was I asked a lot of women around me, family members, 
friends, you know, girls I know, like talking about this topic and asking them, you know, has this ever happened to you? And it was a unanimous, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. That, that's I was happened gonna to me. say, I, yeah, it, I, it was, I, it was very surprised. rough hearing from, yeah, yeah hearing from yeah. very close family members that, you know, oh yeah, there was actually, you know, one of our family members who is now deceased actually did something to me when we were little. And you're, I'm just thrown back. I'm like, what? What the hell? Yeah. And you, you also think like, why didn't you tell me this before? And Women just don't go around telling everybody they've been sexually assaulted. No, it's not just like it a doesn't thing that you just, just come up, up in random yeah. conversation. Right. Right. And we as men, at least I, didn't really ask that. And people like Steven Crowder and people like him who are right leaning, who downplay the Me Too movement. I, I wonder if they've asked. I didn't know. I had never asked. And yeah, yeah, you don't go just you don't just hang out with women. They just start telling you about the time they were, you know, se sexually assaulted or sexually abused when they were young or at work. You know, oh, I, course, I asked, right. I, I had a girlfriend a while back who I'm no longer with. And when I started asking this, I had asked her as well. And she's like, yeah, of course, you know, haven't sold women. Like it's nothing. That was another yeah. thing. It's like almost everyone who talked about this talked about it. So blase. So like, yeah. Is, yeah, of course and if it's not a physical assault or something, it's something, there's always something that was either an advance or some sort of inappropriate mm. speaking. Sexual intimidation. Or, yeah, yeah. All, all kinds of stuff like that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, that's intense stuff. But um, Lalo, we just, just want to thank you again for uh, taking the time to join us again on this podcast. One of the greatest all time guests of the show. Um, can you give us any more insights or uh, hints to your new project, the title or when it's coming out? Or It's just my same podcast that I've been doing that I stopped. The Lalo doing. podcast? Lalo de Gosh podcast uh, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to start doing again. Cool. I'm going to start concentrating on, on uh, cults of all types, not just religious. And uh, just see where that, where that takes me. Because I'm, as a person who is very non-groupthink oriented through my whole life, I am fascinated by groupthink. And how people have this ador like are, are putting themselves in the position of adoration of another human being. Yes. You know, hearing that is very shocking. To it's nothing I've ever considered. Right. Putting myself underneath a person or, or seeing somebody so above me. Uh, I never see people like that. And maybe it's because like I'm also non-religious and I have a disdain for politics that even religious figures i kind of look at the pope or the dalai lama and i'm just yeah. like yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so i don't i, don't, I, I can admire people but never have like that kind of fundamental saturate for sure no that's really ex yeah. i'm excited that you're gonna start that back up because uh yeah you you do have some subscribers there that are waiting for an episode so. <laughs> yeah, like, poor 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 guys <laughs> yeah 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 i'm waiting for a few years well yeah time. thanks again lalo and uh where can they follow yeah. you at lalo Dagash on twitter Lal Degosh everything. Lal Degosh on, on Instagram, Facebook, and the podcast name. Cool. Yeah. Can't wait for the project, man. Thanks again. Thank you. Take care.